you, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, do solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of your ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. I, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. Swiftly, the menace of war grew into dread reality as American ships and ships carrying American citizens were torpedoed, sent to the bottom by the ruthless campaign of the unseen tigers of the sea, the submarines. And finally, the day came when Franklin Roosevelt's chief, President Woodrow Wilson, sadly and reluctantly set his hand and seal to the declaration of war. From the Army cantonments, our boys marched aboard the transports assembled and prepared by the Secretary of the Navy, Josephus Daniels, and his active and enthusiastic young aide, Franklin D. Roosevelt. His work was so valuable that the President sent him to France, where he put the big naval 12-inch guns on military trains to battle back the Germans at Verdun. Tireless as ever, the young assistant secretary witnessed every phase of the war following its course from disarbation docks through the munitions works in the great shipyard. Roosevelt's ardor, he went to the front, met the great Marshal Foch, and saw with his own eyes and heard with his own ears the savage onslaughts of the Germans against the Allies, and the Allies against the Germans. It was a baptism of fire for the young civilian. American punch counted, war-weary Germans surrendered in droves. The end was near at hand, and finally, on that unforgettable November the 11th, the blessed armistice came to the French. The triumphant legions of the Allies and the AEF swept back from the hard-won fields of victory, and over the whole world rose a pean and clamor of hysterical joy at the end of the horrible struggle. Paris, London, New York. Who could ever forget that surging, glorious day of celebration in New York City? From tip to tip of Manhattan Island, the streets were jammed from curb to curb by people utterly abandoned to joy. It was unbelievable, incredible, dazing and dazzling. It was the American spirit unchained and soaring, something to be seen once in a century. But victory is not all celebration. Hard work was yet to be done at home and abroad. The president desired to bring about a just peace which would not carry the seeds of future war. In high hope he went to France with our great commanding General John J. Pershing at his side. He reviewed a full division of crack troops at Chaumont, General Pershing's headquarters. And once more Franklin Roosevelt found himself in France, this time to clean up the debris of war. The AEF was coming home now, its work well done. With song and cheering, they piled aboard the home of bound transport while Assistant Secretary Roosevelt directed the sale and dispersal of naval supplies and cleaned up in his thorough style. Finally, Pershing and the boys were back.
Black Jack heading the greatest and finest army that ever assembled under the stars and stripes. And how a million people roared acclaim that thundering day of the great victory parade in New York City.